I wanted to hand it over to Paul Singh, my colleague from, again, from Wisconsin. Paul, tell us more about how can we leverage the Super 30 space effectively? All right. Thank you, Ike. I appreciate the opportunity. To, thank you to iStar for the, uh, as well for being on the panel. Uh, I am Dr. Paul Singh from the Eye Centers of Racine and Kenosha, which is out in Wisconsin here. And I'm trying to see if I have, there we go. For those of you who don't know where Wisconsin is, uh, it is in the middle of the country. And we are known as the dairy state, meaning we're known as cheese heads. So that was a cheese head that my parents made me to fit over my turban. So I would never forget my roots as a Wisconsin native. So we are just below the Canadian border there. And uh, I forgot my disclosure slides, but I do work and I do work with a lot of the companies in the MIG space, including iStar as well. <laughs> but it is it has been a, a, a wonderful time for us as glaucoma specialists. You know, like Ike was uh, eloquently mentioning and describing, there has been a paradigm shift, a philosophical change in our mindset in terms of earlier intervention, that interventional mindset. And I think we, we when I look back at my practice and, and the past 15 years being out of fellowship, I realized how many patients that I've let go and really avoided surgery because I was fearful of all the risks and complications that are associated with traditional glaucoma surgery. And I look back now and I wonder, wow, if I had had other surgeries early on, I could have saved some of these patients. I think that is the mindset, earlier intervention. And also, again, he mentioned quality of life. That is such a big part of my definition of controlled glaucoma. Many years ago, you know, I, I would just IOP, visual field and optic nerve. And that was all I cared about in terms of controlled glaucoma definition. But now it's really is the patient able to sustain their control throughout a long period of time adherence? So that's a big, big issue now. So as I mentioned, how do we get to this earlier intervention mindset? Well, we needed procedures and that's where the MIGS hallmark was, was safety, right? Is safety was an approach. I think that minimal trauma to the target tissues and that rapid recovery is really important. But at the same time, we needed to have good IOP reduction. That's where that safety, but also efficacy uh, argument is important. And what's exciting about MIGS I think now is the it really re re-emphasis and appreciation for mechanism of action. Where are these different products working? Whether it's the conventional pathway, we'll talk about the super serious space, as I've mentioned, the subcon space, and of course, uh, cilio bladed procedures like ECP as well. So we're paying attention now to outflow and what is happening in the outflow space. And we're going to talk more specifically about this new super serious space again, rather, that's been uh, we've missed, as, as Ike mentioned. And when you look back actually at the conventional outflow pathway and all the different products that are available, you realize there's a lot of products because there's no perfect solution. And, and part of that issue is the fact that we don't know where the resistance to outflow is. It could be that we have resistance in the, in the TM, can we just bypass that alone? Or is it the canal that's collapsed or the distal channels, are they atrophied or are they collapse as well? And so the problem that we face as a, as a provider deciding what to do is that we don't have that great preoperative diagnostic test that tells us this is where the resistance to outflow is, therefore use this technology or this technique. And that is, I think, the biggest stress that I face when I'm picking a MIGS procedure. And, and so as I showed you this picture earlier, what is beyond the TM? Well, they, as we do know from various data sets, that there's collapse in the Schlem's canal, and it could be at different points of the canal as well. So if you're bypassing TM, and there's a collapse in the canal, you may not have the efficacy that we want in that procedure. Hyun Gong has done some great work showing us that in a number of our open angle glaucoma patients that we have complete blockage or herniations that block the ostea into the collector system. And if you look here at a histopathology slide up top, you see a nice, beautiful patent Schlumps canal in a healthy or normal person with a nice opening in the collector system. And on the bottom, that red arrow, you see actually a blockage or herniation blocking the ostea of the collector system. So that's where viscodilating procedures and really access to the collector channels can help in those cases. We also realize from the many studies, and of course, Murray Johnston and others have done great work with the outflow system. We also realize that the distribution of the collector system is not equal throughout the 360 degrees. And so depending on what procedure and where we're accessing the angle, we may not be accessing the amount of collector systems that we need to, to achieve that IOP reduction that we like. And, and lastly, which is, I think, partly a benefit and partly, a, I think, a, a, a potential issue, a barrier is this EVP issue, right? The episcleral venous pressure. What is the pressure in the vessels in the venous system as the uh, aqueous uh, flows out of the eye? Now, the benefit of that is it prevents hypotony, and which is a safety perspective, but at the same time, it, it creates a floor where it's hard for our conventional pathway outflow makes procedures to go below that middle teens section because of the EVP. And so, you know, with all that, that's where I think the supersilious space really does give us this kind of safety, but yet significant efficacy, and as we'll talk about with this uh, space. And again, this is not a new space. This is a space that has been described for over a decade, or, or rather a century. 
And what is a space, it's really between the uh, outer wall of the ciliary muscle as well as the inner wall of the sclera. And so the space is actually a, a space that has a negative pressure gradient. In, in fact, Anders Bill does some great uh, work with radio labeled dyes to understand the outflow in the well and realize that this negative pressure gradient can be up to four to six millimeters of mercury lower than the anterior chamber. And there's a lot more surface area of the ciliary body for the aqueous to penetrate through. So the aqueous travels through the ciliary body, the, at the face of the ciliary body into the interstitium. And then the interstitium of the ciliary body is a main source of resistance that allows fluid to percolate into that supraciliary or supracoroidal space. And that space is a larger potential, so it can handle more volume than the Schlem's canal or the distal channel. So you have the conventional outflow as well as the uveal scleral outflow or the non-conventional pathway. This is not a new concept though. And you know, Heine in 1905 actually created the first cyclodialysis spatula to create a cyclodialysis, a access point to the supercellular space. You see that, that nice UVM image down below showing this once we get past that main barrier of the ciliary body, if we can disinsert that from the scleral spur, we have access to that large space that's behind. And that space allows us reduction of pressure. And this is a nice video and animation from uh, Keith Barton and his group just showing us when you create that, create, when you separate that uh, ciliary body from the scleral spur, you have that access right into that space and fluid can therefore travel. And because that space is larger and there's less resistance once you get past the ciliary body, you have more potential for much lower IOPs. And again, there is that natural negative pressure gradient about four to six millimeters of mercury. And as you increase the interocular pressure, you actually increase that, that pressure gradient between the AC and the supraciliary space. So what makes this, I think, a beneficial space is the fact that we can control and create, rather, a cyclodialysis cleft. And if we can control it, we have a significant power to reduce IOP because of that negative pressure gradient. And I think what we're realizing now, and with the side pass that we had, there was a very straightforward space to access using gonio prisms interoperatively, as, as inter interoperatively, and no bleb creation. Again, this idea of getting away from bleb surgery. And I, I think for us as well, for me, you know, even potentially combining this space with outflow as well as well as the um, subcon surgeries, I think is an option too. And because of the lower risk of traditional filtering surgeries, there's a, there's a great potential of the space. And so for me, you know, where, where would this fit in, in, my, in my algorithm? I think this is where the, the, the excitement of the superstore space is, is really the idea of, it's not just for, you know, the advanced patients, you know, because of the relative safety of the space, we can actually now push it more towards the earlier adoption because of the fact that we don't lose TM, we don't, we're not destroying any TM outflow, we can access the TM later on, but also in those patients who let's say have collapse or atrophy of the uh, collector system, we can perform it in patients who've had, let's say, a previous trap. And so being able to have a larger number of patients, I think is a really important benefit of the super serious space. So what did we learn from the side pass? Well, uh, no doubt, I think a lot of us miss it. I personally miss it. It was a savior for a lot of my patients. Uh, it was an easy, I think, or not easy, but rather a very straightforward learning curve. That learning curve is really impressive and allowed a lot of our surgeons to adopt MIGs because of that. There's a lot more surface area and a landing zone for our doctors to actually implant that, that stent. The also, we also realized it was very powerful. We were able to get pressures nice and low. The issue that we did face, though, was that there was not a lot of consistency for some doctors in how much of the stent to place in the anterior chamber. The longer or the more the stent was in the AC, the higher risk of corneal endothelial cell loss. We also saw there was some fibrosis that was occurring where some patients would have a spike in pressure later on. So we, we understood that it was powerful, it was efficient surgery, and it was kind of more efficient to access that space. But we wanted to minimize the issues of migrations, of endothelial cell loss, and fibrosis. And the Compass XT trials over the five years data showed us the longer that stent is in the AC, the higher risk of endothelial cell loss. And so this is a video from uh, Stephen Bold that just shows us as he's taking this, this side pass out for issues of, of length, you see that nice dark glob at the end of the stent there. That's kind of fibrotic material. And that fibrotic material is what we're seeing when some of those patients have to be have to have a side pass explanted. And I think that's what we're trying to minimize this risk of fibrosis that can cause a spike in pressure or migration. And so what we need, and I think where the, the mini jet comes in is we need a material that is soft and flexible that have less potential to uh, irritate the endothelial cells of the cornea. 
Also, I think for surgeon perspective, a marker on the actual stent to allow us more clarity of where to leave it in the anterior chamber to prevent endothelial cell loss, as well as prevent migrations that we did see sometimes very rarely, but with the side pass. And I think one of the most important points that we need is a material that will minimize fibrosis around that, that stent for but obviously migration issues, but also for IOP control, because we did see again in some patients where that stent would close up, you see a significant rise and spike like we had many years ago when the initial clefts were formed, we did find in those earlier studies that once the cleft closed, we had a significant spike in pressure. So I think again, the power of the supraciliary space is there, no doubt. If we can control it and maintain it in a safe fashion, this is a very, very useful area for us in the future in, in our control of IOP as well. Uh, and so that was just kind of an overview of the supraciliary space and where we're at. And I think because of the COVID virus and then in our new separate and the new uh, restrictions here, I'm going to give you a namaste or a satsrikal. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Paul. I want to take a pause and maybe uh, get some panel discussions. We've had some some questions here that have come up, which, uh, which is great to hear. We have a large group of audience members from across the world here with us today. So that's fantastic. Again, please uh, feel free to uh, enter your questions or comments in the bottom. Don't worry about hurting our feelings. Uh, Philippe and Julian and Paul are really tough guys. They don't mind if you ask some tough questions. So that's okay. And I see, I see some of you have already asked some questions. So we're gonna, I'm gonna throw these questions out to everybody here so they hear them. Uh, one of the first questions that has been asked here is per pertains to um, the trabecular outflow mechanism. In that, do we foresee a time? when we may be able to uh, image uh, these patients, evaluate collector channels uh, prior to surgery to determine which patients would be the best candidates for those types of mixed procedures. Um, who wants to tackle that one first? Okay, thank you. Julian, about to do that. <clears throat> Julian please. I'm Julian from Madrid, Spain. So um, that's, I think that's a very, very relevant question. So I wish we could do that right now because that, could benefit a lot the, the way we can choose the right patient for for the right device. There are some <clears throat> studies uh, out there, and I really believe in the very near future we will we will be able to image. And it's not only a, a question of selecting the patients, but also it will help us to a position or decide where is the, uh, the better position for our dev the regular device. What do you think, uh, Paul? Yeah, I mean, that's the holy grail is, is to figure out which patients need what procedure, what device. And I do agree. I think there's a lot of work right now be, uh, really looking at non-invasive, non rather, diagnostic tools to understand where the resist resistance to outflow is located. And I, I mean, I use, I use my, for me, a surrogate, you know, number of meds. If someone has a lot of medications on board, my assumption is that is the outflow is res restrictions, not just the TM, probably the canal or distal channels, or let's say they failed SLT. But my assumption for a lot of those patients as well is probably the canal or the distal channel. So I will a lot of times combine a viscodilating procedure uh, or a cutting procedure with a stent, let's say, if, if need be. So I think that is really where I'm looking at is, is these clinical pearls uh, to decide where the resistance might be and pick that appropriate device. So it just may be related to this, to this point, and there's been a few questions now that have been asked about this in different ways. So for example, uh, talking about side effects uh, of accessing supercellular space and specifically related to hypotony um, and the concern for hypotony for detachment. So let's focus on that a little bit because I think the first thing I often hear colleagues speak about or think about, I should say, when we talk about the supercellular space, they think of hypotony of the traumatic cleft, for example, or they think of cord detachment. So uh, maybe I'll guess Julian, a question about this in terms of the, the side effects and specifically hypotony with the space in your experience? Well, I mean, <clears throat> I have a quite long experience with previous devices using the supracroidal space. And I think obviously hypotony is a risk, but we have learned that there is, I mean, it's not an important risk. So I, I'm not so concerned about hypotony. So uh, obviously also depends on your surgical technique. So mm -hmm. You have to try to avoid any lateral movements. Uh, so obviously to, to avoid to create a very big cleft when you're inserting whatever device in, into the supracoroidal space. But with the early results with the mini jet and with the previous results with uh, side pass and others, I think 
hypotony is not a big issue, in my opinion. So also we have to move a little bit to the right in terms of the patients who are the best candidates for this kind of surgery. So probably it's a very, um, it's, a, it's a very easy difference between those who are candidates or can benefit from trabecular devices or cutting uh, the, the, uh, the trabecular meshwork and supracroidal devices. If you inject a, a, a mix in the supraciliary space, you may prevent some the risk of hypotony because if you if you do a cytodialysis, you open very largely uh, the, 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 the space. And of course, you have a, it's a very effective to reduce intraocular pressure and the, the pressure goes down. If you put something in it and if you make, make a very limited uh, limited uh, cleft in, in the uvascular outflow pathway, you may prevent th this risk. Of course, surgery is, uh, is maybe a hard more than science, but I think uh, it's, um, it's a good way to prevent that. Yeah, I, I think I think to dovetail off of that real quick, I you know I think the issue that we faced the perception of a cyclodialysis cleft was 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 all, was the reason why it was so worrisome is because of the fact that earlier attempts were not controlled. We didn't have the ability to consistently create this perfectly sized cleft with a cyclodialysis spatula, and and all we a lot of times we would see would be a a, a atrogenic or traumatic cyclodialysis cleft, which was 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 a problem. So yes, hypotony was an issue, and then of course it would close up. And when it closed up, it didn't close up, and the pressure didn't slowly rise. It would suddenly spike, and the patient would have a pressure of fifty or sixty even higher. And so I think with you know the side pass, and of course with the mini jack now and other uh, mixed devices that are coming out, we have a much better control of the flow. And the key I think is not just control of flow to preventing hypotony. I think it's also the ability to prevent fibrosis. I think that is really one for, for me the big issue. Can we cons can we consistently control fibrosis so we have consistent long term uh, not only safety but also efficacy maintained? And I think that's where it's this balance of creating enough flow to keep that efficacy going, but also controlling it enough and preventing fibrosis. And that's where I'm sure you're going to talk more about that. 